Good morning, everybody. It's good to see you. I've been away for a couple weeks. Well, thank you. I was in Minnesota visiting my family these last couple of weeks, and we had a, we had a really good trip. We saw lots of family. We got to swim in a lot of lakes and got to visit some of our favorite American stores. Is there anything more about that? It's always interesting for me when I get to home, go home because I've actually lived here in Canada now for close to 10 years, and I'm officially a Canadian citizen, and, and I, I love it here. I love being Canadian. But I am also still very much American, and I, I know that's true. I find it most often when it comes like to the Olympics. When the Olympics come on, I'm like, okay, this time I'm going to cheer for Canada. But then it starts, and America is winning. And, and I, USA, it just it comes out of me. I can't help it. I'm still very much American. But I do feel willing to admit something now that I've, I've been here quite a while. I am, I'm very willing to admit that we Americans are a bit arrogant. I know you guys have known that for a long time, so <laughs> calm down. We are. A li- we, it's a little bit. We go home, and I mean, there's just there's American flags everywhere, and I have to explain to people a lot, like where Alberta even is, because we we just don't seem to think outside of the continental U.S. too often. But it's it's kind of how we how we grew up as Americans. We talk a lot about about all of our successes and all of our victories, even though there's plenty of misdeeds in America's past. We kind of focus on how we're number one. Today, we're, we're going to continue in the Psalms of Ascent, and we're going to look at Psalm 129. And Israel is also looking back on her past, but not talking about all her victories. They're, they're not being arrogant Americans. They're looking back at their suffering and all of their enemies and the things that they've gone through. So I'm going to read Psalm 129 for us. And if you have a Bible, or if there's one in the, in the seat back in front of you, why don't you grab it and, and read along with me today, because we're going we're gonna to walk through this psalm together. It says here, they have greatly oppressed me from my youth. Let Israel say, they have greatly oppressed me from my youth, but they have not gained the victory over me. Plowmen have plowed my back and made their furrows long, but the Lord is righteous. He has cut me free from the cords of the wicked. May all who hate Zion be turned back in shame. May they be like grass on the roof, which withers before it can grow. A reaper cannot fill his hands with it, nor one who gathers fill his arms. May those who pass by not say to them, the blessing of the Lord be on you. We bless you in the name of the Lord. Thanks be to God for his word. This psalm, Psalm 129, even even with all of its suffering and and all of the enemies, it's actually going to give us a story of hope and of joy and of victory because of the character of God. As we've looked at the Psalms this summer, we've seen that that some of them are kind of odd to be singing on the way up to a feast, right? They're going to celebrate, and and yet they're singing about how their enemies have have plowed furrows on their backs. And by the end of the Psalm, they're they're kind of calling down curses. But we've seen that that Israel has suffered in their history quite a bit. We've talked about how, you know, they had been in Babylon. They were taken over and they they were led into exile. And they suffered under the hands of their Babylonian enemies for 70 years. And we talk about how they're going up to these feasts to celebrate. Well, these feasts are all about remembering the Exodus when God rescued them because they had been suffering in slavery in Egypt. And so that's what Israel's recalling at at the beginning of this psalm in these verses one to three. They've greatly oppressed me from my youth. Let Israel say, they have greatly oppressed me from my youth. Actually, I love those, the phrasing in that first couple of verses. They've greatly oppressed me. Let Israel say, repeat it again. That's true. Say it one more time for emphasis. When we were in Minnesota, Andrew and I got to have a a date night because we had grandparents to watch our kids. And Andrew found us this awesome supper club in downtown Minneapolis. 
And so we went, there was gonna be live music. We went and, and had dinner there. We got to eat some kind of like Southern inspired food. And then there was this jazz gospel pianist there named Corey Henry. He was amazing. He was like a child prodigy. He started to play piano and organ when he was two years old. When he was six, he performed at the Apollo Theater in Harlem for the first time. And he's amazing, like excellent. He's played with all these different groups and, and you watch his hands move up and down the piano as he's creating music and, and you're just kind of in awe. And we're listening to Corey Henry and he's African-American and he started to play some gospel songs. And he played this song about how down through the years, the Lord has been good to him. And there's some African-Americans in the crowd. And as he's playing, they start to say, amen. And they say, say it again. And they're nodding and yeah, hallelujah. How do I put this delicately? The, the crowd, maybe they, they feel or, or respond to the music at a different level than some of us with Dutch or German backgrounds, if I could say that. They're responding to the testimony that's going on because that's what's happening. It's, it's a testimony. It's talking about here's where I was, but here's, here's what God has done. And you see testimony all through the Bible, especially in the Psalms. You say, here's what was going on, but then God. If you go to a black gospel concert, the songs give testimony and the people respond. They say, say it again. It's true. Part of the way that you and I share the good news with people who don't know it, or even share encouragement with other believers is by giving testimony. We talk about what was going on in our lives and then what God has done. We share that truth with people. And so all this week, because of that concert, I've been kind of playing gospel music and, and singing to myself. And, and one of the songs I, I keep playing over and over again says, he's an on-time God. Yes, he is. He may not come when you want him, but he'll be there right on time. He's an on-time God. Yes, he is. Amen? So Israel gives testimony here in verses one to three. They were struggling. Verse three says, plowmen have plowed my back. They've made their furrows long. But they did not gain the victory over me. And why is that? Because God showed up on time. If you look at verse four, it says this. But the Lord is righteous. He has cut me free from the cords of the wicked. Oftentimes, when you're reading Hebrew poetry, what you need to know is that the main point of the poem comes right in the middle of it. Not at the end, not at the beginning, it's right in the middle. And that's what's happening here. This is the main point of this psalm. Verses one to three point us to verse four. And as we'll see later, verses five to eight actually point us back to verse four. The main point of the passage is right here. The Lord is righteous. He is the one who saves us. He is the one who rescues us. He is the one who cuts the cords of the wicked. In the Hebrew, it simply says, righteous Yahweh. He shows up on time. Now, when we say that the Lord is righteous, we're declaring quite a few things, actually, about the character of God because this word is full of meaning. So I want to talk to us quickly just about three main meanings of the word righteous. When we say that God is righteous, it means that he is morally right. It means that, that we can trust his morals and his ethics and his character. He is the plumb line by which we measure what is right what is good. I think I've mentioned before, one of my favorite verses is actually from Deuteronomy 32, and Moses is talking about the character of God. And he says that God is a rock, and his works are perfect, and all of his ways are just. He is a faithful God who does no wrong. Just and upright, righteous is he. I find great comfort in that verse. I find great comfort in the truth that the Lord is righteous. Because I don't always have the right answers. As I get older, as I go through life, 
I realize that, that I often struggle to know what's right. We live in a culture with all different ideas about what is right and what is true. And it can be confusing. Sometimes I open my Bible and I read, and, and I don't always understand everything going on here. I don't understand God's timing all the time. I don't know why, why he allows certain things to happen. I don't always understand. But I do believe with all of my heart that when the scripture says that the Lord is righteous, we can trust that that's true. We can trust that everything he does, all of his judgments, all of his mercies are always right all the time, no matter what. And I might not always understand what God is doing or why he waits or why he acts. I don't always understand. But I actually find comfort in knowing that that is my deficiency and not his. Because I make poor decisions all the time. My opinions are faulty. And we see that all throughout the Bible. We see people making the wrong choice all of the time. The Bible says that often justice goes out crookedly. We make poor choices. We choose sin because our morals have actually been bent by it. We don't always make the right choice. And even for those of us who are, who are redeemed by Jesus, who are, who are Christians, the Bible still tells us that, that we only know in part. We don't fully understand everything yet. It's like we're, we're looking at a dim reflection. We won't fully understand everything and, until Jesus returns. And so because of that, if, if we were depending on Denise's righteousness, well, I would judge too harshly or too quickly, or I'd let people get away with things for way too long, or I would act in vengeance. I cannot be trusted to be a righteous judge. But God's sense of justice, God's righteousness and his goodness can always be trusted because he's the very definition of those things. He is what is righteous. He is morally right, ethically right. His character is true. And we can trust that all the time. Everything he does is just and fair. The second kind of meaning of righteousness, when you look in the Bible and you study the word, has to do with actions. God's actions are right. God is always going to do exactly what is right. If you look in, in the Hebrew and scripture, that the, the phrase Justice and righteousness are paired together all of the time. They often show up together, justice and righteousness. And what that means is that if God's righteousness is at work, it means that acts of justice are taking place. And they're often taking place on behalf of those who are suffering. So for example, when we talk about the Exodus, God saw the Israelites suffering under their slavery in Egypt, under a cruel master, and his righteousness compelled him to step in with justice and act to bring them out. Or when you look at the book of Joshua, we see that, that God puts a stop to the evil of the Canaanites because he has given them hundreds of years to turn from their evil ways. They are a people bent on destruction, a people who are murdering their own children in order to sacrifice them to idols. And so after giving them chances to repent, God's righteousness compels him to step in with justice and stop the actions of these people. God's righteousness means that he can and he does act with justice on behalf of those who are suffering. And the Bible also tells us that, that our righteousness is often measured through acts of justice. And so Jeremiah 22 says, we are to do what is just and right. We're to rescue people from the hand of the oppressor. We're not to do any wrong or violence to the foreigner, the fatherless, or the widow. There are countless verses in the scripture that talk about our righteous actions, caring for those who are in need. We are commanded to act with justice because our God is a God who acts with justice. When I was in Minnesota, I got to see one of my cousins 
And this is a cousin. He and I are about 10 months apart in age, and, and we grew up together. Most of my childhood memories involve this cousin. We were very close growing up. When he was a teenager, he started to experiment with alcohol and with drugs. And for all of his adult life, he has struggled with a severe drug addiction. And last year when we were in Minnesota, we saw him, and he looked so sick. He looked like an old man. He was bent over. He was kind of confused. And I was worried for his life. We saw him again this year. Because of a variety of circumstances, he's clean right now. And he looked a million times better. He looked healthier. You could, you could have a good conversation with him. He was doing really well, and, and we're just hoping and praying that he's able to stay on this path. We saw him on a, on a Saturday, and when he was about to leave, he said this, this place where he's been staying, someone had told him about, about a church that he wanted to try. And so I said, well, I'll go with you. So I picked him up the next day, and we went to this church in a kind of converted warehouse, a tiny, tiny congregation, just a few people. It's in a very bad part of Minneapolis. And this congregation greeted us when we got there, and they welcomed us in. And they said, our church is here for the last and the lost and the least. Our church is here for people who are down and out, people who are suffering. And then the pastor got up and, and he preached the gospel. He preached about how Jesus has come to forgive us of all of our sins, to make us clean. And then they give testimony. They talked about, here is how I had been oppressed. Here is where I was. But God showed up in time. And after the service, they invited us to stay and, and have lunch with them. The people at this church are acting righteously. They are caring for the last and the lost and the least. They are doing acts of justice for people who, who if we saw, we might cross over to the other side of the street. They are acting with justice for those God cares about. And when you and I participate in acts of justice, when we care for the poor, when we seek out the lost, when we speak up for those who have no voice, we're joining God in righteous behavior. And in doing that, we're showing people who God is and what he's like. The third meaning of righteousness has to do with being in right relationship. Right relationship with, with each other, but ultimately right relationship with God because God can make us right. He can make us righteous. For those of us who, who follow Jesus, we recognize that, that we chose to sin. We chose to actually break our right relationship with God and choose unrighteousness. But then God who acts with justice, saw us, a people suffering under the burden of our own sin, and he stepped in to act on our behalf. He came in the flesh, and Jesus fulfilled the prophecy of Jeremiah 23 that says that one day God was going to send a king who will always, all the time, do what is just and righteous. And it says that he's actually going to be known by the name, the Lord, our righteous Savior. And so when Jesus died for us, he actually provided a way for us to be back in right relationship with God. Second Corinthians tells us that, that Jesus, who had no sin, became sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Through Jesus, God made a way for us to be made right, for us to be righteous. So when we see verse 4 and we see that the Lord is righteous, we know that it means he is right. He is morally and ethically right. And it means that he does what is right. He acts with justice. And it means that, that he's 
right relationship. He's made a way for us to be righteous. The Lord is righteous. And so verses one to three, we've suffered. Our enemies almost overcame us, but they didn't. The Lord showed up in time. He's righteous. But then we move through the rest of the psalm, and it it takes a bit of a turn here. It says, may all who hate Zion be turned back in shame. May they be like grass on the roof, which withers before it can grow. No one should pass by our enemies and say to them, the Lord bless you. Psalm 129 is often included in a list of what people call the imprecatory psalms. Psalms that call down curses or judgment on enemies or on the wicked. And Psalm 129 is actually a a pretty tame example of this. There are other passages that that talk about how, God, we want you to, to break the teeth of the wicked, tear out their fangs. God, we want you to pour out your fierce anger on them. We want them to drown in your wrath. And it's not just in the Psalms. If you, I've been reading the prophets lately. There's lots of harsh, intense language in the prophets about the wicked. And in the New Testament, Revelation has lots of harsh language. Jesus, in Matthew 23, is talking to the religious leaders, and he says that, that they're hypocrites, they're blind guides. He says, you're full of wickedness, you're children of hell. This is Jesus talking. So what do we do with this kind of language? Because it doesn't feel very Christian. We're supposed to love our enemies. And Pastor Dan talks often about how we should pray the Psalms. Well, should we pray these ones? I don't know. But you know, I was thinking about it and and thinking about my own personal response to harsh language like this. And I realized I think some of it comes out of our own personal experiences. Because for some of us, overall, we've lived fairly comfortable lives. And so we read language like this, and and it seems a bit too mean, a bit too harsh. Because I can look at my life, and, you know, I've had some bumps along the way, but ultimately, I've, I've never been hungry. I've felt pretty safe in my North American context. I could go to my social media and and look through all my list, and I don't think I'd have anyone I'd call an actual enemy on there. And so because my experience hasn't been one of suffering, I kind of want to spiritualize all this language, or or I'm quick to remind us, but but we're supposed to pray for those who persecute us. And I kind of want to move past it quickly, get to forgiveness. And then there's probably another group of us on on the other side that we kind of like this language. We kind of seek it out, all this intense, harsh language, and we want to use it against our enemies. Because in our culture today, lots of us are outraged. People are always mad at something, whether it's politics or who knows what, we're mad. And if you forget what you're mad about today, no worries, because tomorrow Twitter will tell us what to be mad about. We're angry. And so we, we seek out imprecatory language like this, and, and we're going to use it against those people, our enemies on social media, or in the people we're willing to have arguments with, or we're going to figure out how we can defeat our enemies through power. We're going to do it through our votes or through the schools or whatever it might be. We don't mind this language. We want our enemies to fall. But when we have this mindset, the tendency can be for us to seek out vengeance on our own. We're going to get our power through any means necessary. And we fail to remember that Romans 12 tells us, actually, vengeance belongs to the Lord. It's his. And then we have a third category of people, people who have suffered deeply at the hands of the wicked. People who read a psalm like this, and there are true enemies that have hurt them. I think of people who who live in countries where there's there's not even a a semblance of any kind of, of true justice system. 
Justice is always going out crooked, bought with bribes. I think of people who are, who are truly persecuted for their faith, people who cannot talk about Jesus. They'll be put in prison at the hands of their enemies. We have refugees in our congregation, people who had to leave their own countries because it was no longer safe for them. They had to flee their enemies. They can understand these psalms. I think of people who have experienced physical and sexual and verbal abuse, innocence, who have not been able to speak for themselves. They've suffered evil at the hands of the wicked. And that's why we need these psalms. They give us language to call out to God against the very real evil in the world, the very real enemies that people face. And when we are filled with despair or when we are filled with righteous anger, we can go to these psalms and we can ask God to do something. We can ask him to act with righteousness. When we pray these psalms, it's a way of pushing back against the evil in the world. But here's what's important to note. When we see psalms like this, when we see language like this in the Bible, they are not about personal vengeance. They're not about me paying back someone who has wronged me. When you look at Psalm 129, he wants his enemy to wither. He wants his crops to fail. There, he doesn't even want a handful of harvest for his enemy. But the psalmist is not the one going out to set fire to his enemy's crops. And this is where that psalm pushes us back to the main point of the passage. Verse 4, the Lord is righteous. Verses 5 to 8 are calling on God to bring justice, calling on him to take care of the wicked because he's the one we can trust to judge righteously. He is the one we can trust to be fair. Now, these imprecatory psalms, you know, they give God some suggestions for how we think he should deal with the wicked. There's some graphic language there. Here's what we want you to do to them, God. But that's because the psalms allow us to vent. All over the psalms, we see anger and we see fear and we see crying out to God. And God can handle that. He's put it in the scripture. He can handle your doubts. He can handle your questions. He can handle your suggestions for what to do with the enemy. But what we do is we cry out to God, we give him some ideas of what we'd like him to do, and then we trust him to act righteously. We trust him to judge in the right way. We trust him to extend mercy for the right amount of time. We trust him to even offer forgiveness to our enemies because he is righteous. He is the one we can trust to be a fair and just judge. So what does this look like practically for us? Well, I've given, I'm going to give you a couple examples of how I personally have used some of the imprecatory language in the scripture. In May of 2022, you probably remember this, there was a terrible shooting in Uvalde, Texas at an elementary school. The shooter went in and he just started killing. He killed like 21 people and 19 of them were children. For some reason, the police waited over an hour before they went in to stop this shooter, before they took his life. Over an hour. And I heard about this shooting, and that night I was thinking about those parents. Parents who had lost their babies. Parents who some couldn't even identify their children because of the gunshot wounds to their faces. It was an incredible evil. And so the next day I was, I was teaching our foundations course here at the church. 
and I opened our time together by reading Psalm 10. Psalm 10 is an imprecatory psalm, and it says this, talking about the wicked, the wicked lie in wait near the villages. From ambush, he murders the innocent. He says to himself, God will never notice. He covers his face and never sees. Arise, Lord, lift up your hand, O God. Do not forget the helpless. You, God, see the trouble of the afflicted. You consider their grief and take it in hand. Break the arm of the wicked man. Call the evildoer to account for his wickedness that would not otherwise be found out. God, rise up. Break the arm of the wicked. Act with justice for those who have suffered. Rise up. During Advent season last year, Mark and Lisa Honorat were here, and they're from Haiti, and they were talking about how the situation really has gone from bad to worse in Haiti. And they shared about how they hadn't even been able to go there for so long because the gangs have taken over. They're running the streets. The airport wasn't safe to get in and out of. I see that they're there now, so praise the Lord for that. And then a couple days later, I read this article in the BBC, and the image there is from that. And it was talking about Haiti, talking about these gangs and how, how people in their cars are getting murdered on the way to work, how children are being killed in front of their parents, women are being raped in the streets. And Haiti was on my heart, and I felt in despair for this country, for this situation that feels incredibly hopeless. And so this time I turned to Isaiah. I turned to Isaiah 64 and I called out to God. I said, oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down, God, that the mountains would tremble before you as when fire sets twigs ablaze and causes water to boil, come down to make your name known to your enemies. Cause the nations to quake before you. I said, God, come down. Fix this situation. May those who do evil tremble in your presence, God. Show the wicked your righteousness. Passages like this in Scripture, they allow us to call out to God from hopeless situations and ask for justice. So as you read the news this week, or or as you deal with someone who's suffering, you can use Psalm 129. You can say, God, thwart the plans of the wicked. May may their evil plans not be bountiful. Don't even let them have a, a handful of harvest. Thwart the plans of the wicked, God. And ultimately, as, as we think about Psalms like this, Psalms with that harsh, imprecatory language, we need to remember that all of us have fallen short of the righteousness of God. So before you run out to find an enemy to pray an imprecatory psalm over, remember that we have all been enemies of God. We have all acted with wickedness. Any righteous acts we think we might have, the Bible says, are filthy before the Lord. But God provided us with that righteous Savior, the one who is willing to forgive us even while we were still sinning, even while we were his enemies. And so as we protest evil with with psalms like this, we, we hold it in tension with the reality that God has also called us to love our enemies, to pray for those who persecute us, just as Jesus did when he was offering up his own back to be plowed for our sins. Praying, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. So we pray for God's mercy for ourselves, for our enemies. And then we trust his righteousness because one day he will act in justice and set everything right. We can count on that. So as we go this week, remember the Lord is righteous. He is righteous, all of of his character. He does what is right. 
He acts in justice and he provides a way for us to be righteous. And when you see those are suffer- who are suffering or, or you hear the news this week, ask God to thwart the plans of the wicked. Ask him to come down and, and bring justice. Protest evil through your prayers. And then go back and remember how Psalm 129 started. We had suffered, but our enemy did not gain the victory over us. We tell the story of of hope and of grace and of joy because God showed up on time. And so today, this afternoon at four, I hope all of you come back for our tailgate party because we'll eat food and we'll talk We'll talk with old friends. We'll meet new friends. And, you know, we'll talk about the fun things that we've done this summer. We'll talk about our plans for fall. We'll talk about how we think our our football teams are going to do. Go Vikings. They won't go, but that's okay. It never happens. But some of us might also give testimony. And we'll say, you know what? We were oppressed. Here's what was oppressing me. But you know what? It did not gain the victory over me. And why is that? Because the Lord is righteous. He showed up on time. And we'll praise him. We'll respond. We'll say amen. We'll say, say it again. Say it again. The Lord is righteous. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for your word and all it has to teach us about your good character, who you are and what you've done. We thank you, Lord, that you see those who suffer, that you you care about them, your heart breaks for them, and, and you act on their behalf. We thank you that you did that ultimately through Jesus Christ who is sent to rescue us from our oppression. We're grateful to you today, Lord. And so as we go today, we'd pray, we'd we'd go with songs of joy, remembering where we were, but how you showed up on time, remembering what you've done for us, Lord. So we praise you together for that today. In Jesus' name.